Well, we come once again to our ongoing and in-depth investigation and study of the Sermon on the Mount, a sermon preserved for us in three chapters of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We have uh, come now, please open your Bibles to Matthew 6. This morning we are specifically looking at verses 5 down to the end of 8. Jesus has already gone through his sermon introduction and his first point, that being that if you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, he's got stark and very bad news for you. Entrance into the kingdom of God requires perfect adherence to God's law. Well, that eliminates everyone. No one has kept God's law perfectly and at every moment of their lives. And to break even the smallest part of God's law is tantamount to breaking the entirety of it. So his first point is that no one is righteous enough to come into the kingdom. His second point, then, dovetails off of that and preemptively cuts off anyone who may say, all right, perhaps I'm not righteous enough now, but I will get righteous enough in the future. I will work to become righteous, or um, I, will, I will work to become so noticed of God that he will bestow me with righteousness. Well, that won't work either, because righteous actions do not a righteous person make. And this second sermon point will take up all of Matthew chapter 6 and the first few verses of Matthew chapter 7. Jesus will say, you're not righteous enough to come into the kingdom of heaven by your own merit, nor can you make yourself so. And in that second sermon point, he will give us five illustrations. Now, these five illustrations, in each of them, he presents a contrast. He first gives us an action that is the kind of thing that is happening all around him here in first century Judea, the kind of thing that the religious leaders of the land are doing, and by since they lead by example, the kind of thing that is being emulated by the average men and women as they too try to become righteous, as they try to become godly and good enough. Well, Jesus cuts through all of that. He says, these are just play acting. These are what he calls the actions of hypocrites, a Greek word that is used in the first century to describe stage actors. So he contrasts actions, which ultimately are of no value, with the evidences that true kingdom citizens, if you were really a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, this is how you would do one of these five actions. Now, the first one he begins with, that we looked at in uh, weeks previously, is the giving of alms. He begins by talking about charitable giving and highlights the charitable giving that hypocrites do. That is, they do it very prominently. They do it to be seen. They do it so that other people will look at them and go, oh, how generous and godly and righteous is this person giving out all his money cutting all these checks, we might say. We must, uh, we must elevate that person. We must uh, reward their generosity. Well, Jesus says that that's the only reward you're going to get because your Father in Heaven isn't paying your hypocritical charity any mind. Rather, there is an evidence. If you were really a citizen in the Kingdom of Heaven, it would be proved because your charitable giving would be done in secret. It would be done out of love for the Lord. It would be done to provide again out of love because you have much and there are those around you who have little. And you would give so humbly, Jesus says, that it would be almost as if you were giving with one hand and the rest of your body had no idea what was happening. Now note that that was not an action. He's not describing, okay, don't, pr don't give publicly, give secretly. He is describing an action, this is how hypocrites give, and he contrasts that not with another action, but with an evidence. If you were really a kingdom citizen, this is how you would give. And we will see this pattern, contrasting action with evidence, throughout the rest of the illustrations he uses to make this overall second point. So, 
Let's turn to our text now, Matthew 6, beginning at verse 5. And you will see, not only this week, but in the weeks to come, we have come to the second illustration. We've talked about charitable giving, we've talked about almsgiving, and now we come to prayer. And we can tell, just by the amount of text that Jesus dedicates to this illustration, that prayer is not only near and dear to the Savior's heart, but it stands as one of the central pillars for those who would claim to be citizens in the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, beginning at verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men, Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Pray the Lord answer his blessing to that reading. J.C. Ryle, who was an English theologian, had this to say about faith and prayer and the relationship between the two. Quote, Faith is to the soul, what life is to the body. Prayer is to faith, what breath is to life. How a man can live and not breathe is past my comprehension. How a man can believe and not pray is past my comprehension too. Close quote. Well, what both J.C. Ryle and our Lord are hammering home for us this morning is that prayer is one of the chief indicators whether or not you are in the kingdom or outside of it. How a person prays is a clear indicator of whether you are a kingdom citizen or whether you are just play acting, whether Jesus knows you or whether he knows you not. There is a way of praying which seems like it's earnest and holy, God-honoring, it seems like it would be the kind of thing that would gain the Almighty's attention, like it would be answered by him and quickly. It seems like this is how a man or woman of God, this is how they pray. And if you want to also be in God's good graces, then this is the kind of prayer that you should emulate, that you should copy and follow. However, that type of prayer is ultimately pointless. God does not hear it, he does not pay it any mind, and he certainly does not reward it. Those who pray in this manner gain only one reward, and that is the admiration of other people. Jesus contrasts this with an evidence and says that if you are a true citizen of the kingdom, when you pray, the admiration of your fellow citizens is about the farthest thing from your mind, because you understand that your prayer is your direct communion with Almighty God. And so when kingdom citizens, when genuine godly people, when Christians pray and genuinely pray, they do not do it to be seen of men, they do it in secret, as it were, nothing getting in the way, and as distraction-free as possible. They pray not to be seen by their fellows, they pray to be heard by the Father. They come not with a desire to be seen, but they come with humility. Now, of course, Jesus had to address this because by the time he begins his earthly ministry, the religious leaders in the land were doing the former and not the latter. They were hypocrites. They were presenting a false caricature of righteousness and holy living. And one of the ways that they did so was to pray long and loud and very publicly. 
Jesus says here, standing in the synagogues, so this would have been uh, on the Sabbath day, this would have been the, uh, let's, let's for our purposes call it the church building, so when the faithful gather to hear the scriptures read and to hear explanation and teachings of the scripture, there would always be a time of prayer in that, of course, and when they gather, those who are leading the prayer are doing so elaborately and very publicly. But they're not only doing it there. It doesn't only happen within the walls of the synagogue. It's also happening out in the public square. It's happening literally on the corners of the streets so that everybody, no matter what their standing is, can look and see. This is the reward that the Pharisees are desperately seeking the adoration of men it's adoration what they want is to be seen as being godly and this is not only damning for themselves it's damning ultimately for everyone else because if that's the example that's being set that this is how you are to pray if you pray like this you will get god's attention if that's the example being set, the lesson being taught, when everyone else copies that, they are in fact just copying something that is uh, that's pointless. Jesus, when he confronts the Pharisees in Matthew 23, says that when they do these things, when they set these incorrect examples, they are in fact making twofold sons of hell. That is that there are people that are already on their way to an eternal punishment in hell because God's wrath was bent against them because of their sin and instead of helping them change their standing before God instead of helping them repent of their sin they're just compounding the error they're still on their way to hell but there's a new double tragic aspect is that when they get there they're going to be convinced and very confused because they were certain that they were actually on their way to heaven False examples just make things worse. And so, we begin this morning by establishing that there are two kinds of hypocrites. Then and today, there are those who are aware, maybe even if they've buried it, deep down inside, there are those who are hypocrites and know it. And then there are those who are hypocrites, but think they're doing the right, because they are actually just following and copying the hypocrites. Well, it doesn't matter if it's intentional or accidental. God hates hypocrisy. He always has. Turn with me, uh, I'll give you a brief example. Turn with me, if you would, to um, the minor prophet Amos, or if you want, you can just, um, this is the beauty of having this as a recording on YouTube, you can either pause me and turn to it, or you can just make a note. Amos. He's one of the 12 minor prophets, so um, if you're looking for him, go past the major prophets, and if you hit the New Testament, you've gone too far. Amos 5, verses 21 to 23. Now, Amos is writing to apostate Israel, that is, Israel, who is supposed to worship the one true living God exclusively, and if you know anything about their history, they never really did that until they were punished by going into exile for 70 years. They worshipped God, but then they also kind of hedged their bet a little bit. They would uh, wane back and forth, worshipping false idols. And finally, speaking through the prophet Amos, God has this to say to the entire nation. Amos 5.21 I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. What God is saying through the prophet is that if you're not going to worship me rightly, exclusively, correctly, that is, with a genuine heart. God says, if your worship is in fact two-faced, if it's play-acting, if it's hypocritical, I'd just as soon you didn't. It doesn't matter how elaborate your celebrations and calendar feast days are, I don't care about them. You can bring me all the offerings you want. I, I don't accept them. 
Oh, you wrote me a, a, a wonderful, catchy praise song that goes on for 25 minutes? I will hear it not. Even if it's played on Stradivarius violins. False worship. God not only ignores it, but it angers him. Now, this is not the sole purview of one of the minor prophets. Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, probably the chief of the major prophets, begins, Isaiah 1, he brings a similar condemnation. Isaiah 1.13, again, this is the Lord speaking through the prophet Isaiah, and the situation is exactly the same. The Lord says this at verse 13, Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands... I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. That's Isaiah 1, 13 to 15. Again, false, empty, half-hearted at best worship. God would just as soon you didn't. When such worship is made, and here at verse 15, when such prayers are made, God actually doesn't hear them. He actively turns deaf. He will not acknowledge them. He certainly will not answer them. And in fact, the more you do it, the angrier he gets. Now why? Because God hates hypocrisy. Why does God hate hypocrisy? I'll give you four quick reasons this morning why it angers God. Firstly, it makes a mockery of that which he calls good. God has ordained how men and women are to come and worship him. Even here in the Old Testament, what is acceptable to him in terms of worship, what is not acceptable to him. When people gather and worship him wrongly, incorrectly, and that's not only in terms of liturgy or action, but really in terms of intention and in terms of where their hearts are, if they are not coming with the right attitude, it angers him because it makes a mockery of that which he says is good. It also angers him because it is self-delusion. This is what we're talking about those who follow the hypocrites, who end up being compounded hypocrites. They, their, their actions are hypocritical, but they think they're doing the right because they're just following what they've seen. They're, they're living out what they've been taught. But it's all self-delusion. What it does, false worship, what it does, hypocrisy, is it makes a generation of people who mistake false godliness for the real thing. And God sees it for what it is. But the people doing it, they think they're on the straight and narrow. They think they're on the inside track. They think with every verse they sing, with every long prayer they give, with every sacrifice they offer, they don't realize the hypocrisy of it. They actually think they're making strides towards relationship and repentance and increasing their standing before God. It's all delusion. God hates that. Because it doesn't bring his children close to him. It, in fact, drives them farther away. Which leads to this third point that I have here. God hates hypocritical prayers in this specific instance, but worship in a larger sense. He hates hypocrisy because it does nothing to save. It does nothing to restore sinful fallen men back into right relationship with holy almighty God. The Puritan writer Thomas Watson said this, quote, What good will it do a man when he is in hell that others think him in heaven? Close quote. In other words, you live a life that by all appearances was righteous and godly, but if it did nothing to save, 
all that righteousness, all that godliness, all that acclaim ends at the edge of the grave. And when you die, it is not into eternal life that you will go, it is into eternal punishment you, that you will go. Well, those who so looked up to you will think, of course, that you went on to heaven. I mean, how could you not? Your actions were so righteous. But in fact, it was all surface. It was all pantomime. It had no substance, no legitimacy. It did nothing to save. Well, what is one of the things that God desires most? 1 Timothy 2, 4, he desires all men, that is, men and women from all strata of society, from every nation, from every tribe, from every tongue, from every time and place. He desires them to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Hypocritical worship hypocritical prayer, hypocritical religious actions stand in total opposition to the truth, and therefore they stand in total opposition to God's desire. They do nothing to save. So ultimately, this is, would be our fourth point, why God hates hypocrisy. To sum up all the other three, God hates hypocrisy because it is pointless. And because God hates it, Jesus hates it too. So here he gives fair warning to return back if you've turned away from it, to our text at Matthew, Matthew 6, he gives fair warning. If you're praying like this, you're getting no reward from your Father in heaven. Rather, if you were a kingdom citizen, this is how you would pray. You would do it away from the crowds. You would do it secretly. You would do it in an, as much of, much of an effort as you could to just have private time with the Father. When he talks about here about a closet, just a historical architectural note, what he's talking about is um, in a first century uh, home in Palestine in, in this day and age, there really weren't a lot of rooms with doors, but there may have been, the word here in the KGV is closet, it's probably, some scholars say, uh, closer to a storeroom. Um, so he's saying, Wherever it is, get away from the crowds. Now, get away from the crowds because they're not doing you any good, but also get away from the crowds. Seek out quiet time because that's also cutting out a distraction and temptation. Even when we come to church here in 20, our 21st century contemporary setting, there is always, always this underlying temptation and desire to pray well to use eloquent speech, to really hit the points, to, well, Jesus says, look, if that's holding you back, if that is, if that fear, if that anxiety, if that desire is getting in the way of your time with the Father, then find the most private place that you can and pray there. He will meet you there. He will see now, Jesus had to address this because faults had started over the generations and over the centuries. Faults had started to creep into how the Jews prayed. It had become a ritualized liturgy, is what he talks about standing in the synagogues, right? Maybe some of you are coming to us from out of, uh, um, well, we're just poor Baptists here, so I guess we would call it a high church background. Anglican, maybe even Roman Catholicism, you may have come from a church background where there is what's called a liturgy. That is, there are prayers established throughout the calendar year. Okay, it's, it's the 10th Sunday of the year. This is what we pray on the 10th Sunday of the year. And then even within the service, there are certain prayers and um, responses. And these can just become rote they can just be, I've been in so many services, where people just mumble their way through, and they're not engaging with it, either with heart or mind, but they are simply answering the prayer, or going through the prayer, because this is the time in the service that we do the prayer. There's no engagement with it. Well, that is, believe it or not, that's hypocrisy too. You're play-acting, you're just play-acting with very low energy, and it's not convincing. It's certainly not convincing to God. So, this 
turned up to 11 was what Jewish prayer looked like in Jesus' day. It was all set liturgy, and it was all repeated from memory. Now there's really, let me, let me, let me pause and just feel like I have to add something here. It's not that there's anything wrong with a set liturgy. The danger is when that becomes mindless repetition. When it's just, this is what we sing because we've passed the collection plate. Uh, this is what we say because the service has come to an end or the service is beginning. The, the danger, the, the hypocrisy always sets in, not in the text, but in the attitude with which the text is said. The attitude with which the prayer is given. Just as the hypocrisy is revealed in the attitude by which the alms are donated. It's not the action itself that's sinful. It's the heart of the person doing it that ultimately stains or elevates the action. That either makes it just a, an, an action, as we've said, or it becomes an evidence of genuine transformation. So Jesus here draws sharp distinction between the intended audience. Are you praying for men or are you praying for the Father? But he's, he's got more to say on this. And at verse 7 and 8, he also gives us this to think about. Now think about the actual content. Now here he gives us something very interesting. When ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. Heathens, these would be non-Jews, these would be Roman citizens, these would even be, you know, the pagans out of the very fringes of the known world, praying to their false gods. What did they do? Well, they had this attitude, bigger and longer has got to be better. Because our gods might be distant, they might be asleep, they might, uh, they might be engaged in revelry. I'm sure that they've got better things to do than listen to us. So when we pray, we've really got to repeat ourselves often, and maybe in increasing volume and fervency. Jesus says, none of these things are necessary. Don't, don't think that you have to scream long and loud to get the Father's attention. And he says it right here. They think that they'll be heard for their much speaking. And as with so many things that Jesus highlights in the Sermon on the Mount, this really should have been well known by both the scribes, the Pharisees, that is the religious leaders, and all of the people that were following and emulating them, because there was a clear Old Testament for them, a clear biblical example of the fruitlessness of this. You may remember this story from 1 Kings 18. This is Elijah in competition against the prophets of Baal. Elijah, uh, who says, um, here at verse 22, says unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. He, everyone else seems to have fallen away from following the one true living God. Instead, they are following Baal, a false deity. Elijah and the prophets of Baal, he finally has it out with them here in 1 Kings 18, and they have a competition. Let's see whose God is really the greatest. And so, if you remember this story from your, maybe your Sunday school, he proposes a competition. He says, uh, we will each build an altar. You build an altar to Baal, I will build an altar to the Lord. And then on top of the altar, we will put wood. And then on top of the wood, we will put a bull for a sacrifice. And then we will each ask our gods to send fire to light the sacrifice. And uh, Elijah says, I, whoever lights the best, or lights at all, I guess we'll know whose god is really supreme in the land. So in 1 Kings 18, we actually have a description of this. And the priests of Baal go first. I guess they have home field advantage. Here at verse 24, Elijah says to the prophets of Baal, he says, call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. He'll be the winner. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, so he, he has them go first. And the prophets of Baal begin calling on Baal to light this fire. At verse 26, 
They took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and they called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O oh, Baal, hear us! But there was no voice, nor any that answered, and they leapt upon the altar which was made. And when it came to pass at noon, Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, right? Maybe you should pray louder, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing Maybe he's off chasing women, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. And so they, this is the prophets of Baal, cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past that they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was neither a voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. So the prophets of Baal, in their heathen pattern, do exactly what Jesus says you're not supposed to. Use vain repetitions as the heathen do, that is, pray loud and long and fervent and excitedly and charismatically. It is all to naught. It doesn't impress God whatsoever. This is what pagans do, because this is what pagans think they have to do. They, their gods are distant or not listening or uninterested or they're off chasing women or they're engaged in wine and song or they're sleeping. And so they pray big and loud because they feel they have to. It sets them in absolute contrast with the Father in heaven who sees in secret and is always present, who is always there and does not require such things. And lest you think that this is an old-timey Bible thing that happens, let me take you to 21st century Kansas City, Missouri, where there is something called IHOP. Not the restaurant, not the International House of Pancakes, uh, rather the International House of Prayer, a hyper, hyper charismatic uh, church, let's put that word in quotes, where for over 20 years now, there has been round-the-clock praying. I actually found a an article written about this from the Los Angeles Times, and this dates back to 2011, and it describes how there is a room inside the International House of Prayer, they actually come and pray in shifts, so that 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, there is prayer going and going and going. They actually have shifts. It's factory work for them. In fact, I have a quote here from this Los Angeles Times article. Quote, we just shifted our schedule to make it work, said Ruth, who was one of the women there, raising her voice over the pulsating beat. Close quote. Yeah, it's important to note that it's not just prayer. There's also a, uh, where is it here, an 11-member Christian rock band that's also playing to help keep the prayer going well, in 2011, it had been going on for 12 years. I believe it is now going on pushing 22 years. Well, what are they praying for down there at the International House of Prayer that warrants such long and fevered prayer? Well, I, I won't get into it, but it all has to do with what they call dominion theology. They believe that Christ won't return until Christians satisfactorily clean up the earth to Jesus' uh, liking. He's not going to come until everything is sufficiently under the control of the church. That's the government and the arts and the lands and the souls of men. What are some of the examples of what they're praying here? Again, I'll, I, I go to this article from the Los Angeles Times. Let me read you this paragraph instantly. Lead singer Misty Edwards, a waif-like woman with a powerful voice, picks up the theme, and here's what she's saying. Quote, we cry on behalf of the poor and the needy. We cry on behalf of these broken souls in Seoul, Korea. She improvised, her voice rising. She poured it on. May justice roll down like a mighty river. May justice roll down for the sake of the needy, for the sake of the poor. Close quote. Repetition. Fervency. Continuous praying. This is the prophets of Baal in Kansas City. All hypocritical, 
whether or not they realize it. And I'm going to cut them some slack, and I don't believe that they actually realize just how far from genuine prayer this effort is. Because it is all based on vain repetitions. And they think, I mean, 22 years is a lot of much speaking. God pays it no heed. You want to know what God does pay a heed? Turn to Luke 18. Uh, Luke 18, verse 9. Here it is. This is a parable that is uh, most often called the Pharisee and the tax collector. Uh, you know, I hadn't actually planned to speak on this, but it just strikes me as an example of the, the, the opposite, the antithesis of, what, of long, fervent, hypocritical prayer that does nothing. Listen to Jesus describing the difference between a Pharisee and a tax collector. He speaks uh, this parable, and he's speaking it, if you've got your text there, Luke 18, 9, he speaks this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So he's speaking this parable about hypocritical praying to those who really think they're righteous but are in fact hypocritical. They believe in themselves that they're righteous. God does not actually back this up. Verse 10 of Luke 18. Here's the parable. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, the other a publican. He's a tax collector. He's the most despised of all the Jews. And the other, the Pharisee, is one of the well-respected, righteous, pious religious leaders, right? Two men couldn't be more different. The Pharisee, Jesus says at verse 11, stood and prayed thus with himself. So here's the Pharisee's prayer. Tell me if you think God pays this any heed. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And that's the Pharisee's prayer. God, aren't you lucky to have me? I'm so good. I, I cross every T. I dot every I. But mark the other man's prayer, all right? Mark the publican's prayer here at verse 13. And the publican, standing afar off, right? he's, he's, he's off in a corner. He's not where the public can see him. He's not in the limelight. He's not in a prominent place in the temple. He's standing afar off. The publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast... He's so ashamed, he's so aware of his sinful, fallen, broken state, this tax collector, that he can't even bear to look up into heaven. His shame is so heavy, it drags his eyes down. And he doesn't spread his hands wide in a gesture of piety. The only gesture he makes isn't for show, it's heartfelt. He beats his chest he beats his heart and hears his prayer in its entirety. Ready? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's it. Seven words. What's the end result, Jesus says? Verse 14. I tell you, this man, that is the tax collector, the man with the passionate short, heartfelt, humble, contrite, genuine, pleading prayer. This man went down to his house justified rather than the other. God looked at that man and considered him righteous, whereas the Pharisee, God didn't even listen to him at all. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, Jesus concludes. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. A seven-word prayer more moves the Almighty than does something long and elaborate. Why? Because it's not the words that are as important as the heart that engenders the words. And so long, vain repetitions for all the wrong reasons. God would, just as he said in Amos, just as he said to Isaiah, I'd rather you didn't even bother.
So our approach to prayer is of paramount importance. Listen, is there any one of us this morning, myself included, who are 100% satisfied with our prayer life? I'll let that Puritan writer, Thomas Watson, have the final word this morning. And may his pleading prayer be ours as well as we enter into the rest of this examination. I mean, this is so important that Jesus is actually going to, in a sense, he's going to put the sermon on pause. He's going to put the Sermon on the Mount on pause. And instead of just saying, don't pray like this, pray with this spirit, don't do this, pray like this, he's actually going to give an example of what real prayer, what genuine, heartfelt prayer, the kind that God listens to and acknowledges and smiles upon, what it is like. He's actually going to give us a prayer, a framework for prayer. That's how important this is. So let us this morning consider, every one of us, the state of our prayer life. And let us echo the words of Thomas Watson, who simply said this, quote, Lord, let me be anything rather than a hypocrite. Close quote.